Hello, and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. This episode, as promised, I am back from Europe before the Great War, before the cataclysmic shifting event of the 20th century, um, which, I mean, you know, we all think about World War II a lot, but you only think about World War I, how much stuff was changed and swept away, and you know, just the alteration of the landscape alone. Um, it's staggering to think about the changes that went on with it. But that's another story for another time, as they say at the end of Conan the Destroyer. So, I'm back with Europe in Turmoil, Prelude to the Great War, designed by Chris Van Bearden and published by Compass Games. Now, this episode, I'm going to highlight Stuka Joe's Solo CDG method. For those of you who may have heard of this um, and may have uh, been curious about it as well, too, there is an individual on Board Game Geek named, obviously, Stuka Joe, who has come up with this method and has given some specific uh, examples as well. Um, or I should say, maybe not examples is not the word perhaps specific uh, instructions for certain games. Like he first devised this for Paths of Glory. Um, I forget exactly how long ago he came up with this. But Stuka Joe designed it for that and then he has specific tweaks uh, for certain games like um, Oh Empire of the Sun also has for 1866 which is also from Compass Games about the uh, the uh, Austro-Prussian War, the Seven Weeks War, if you will. So to give credit where credit's due, here is Mr. Stuka Joe in his avatar on uh, Board Game Geek. Okay, uh, there's my entry on the either solo or war games on your table uh, space. There, I'm giving him credit, full credit for this, because it's a very clever system. I've enjoyed it and used it before. Now. I'm going to use it today a little differently. Strictly speaking, it's supposed to be used where you have the system basically limit your choices for both players. What I like to do sometimes is actively play one side and let Stuka Joe's uh, solo method run the opposite side and you know see what happens. And I've found myself personally that it actually still makes for very fun and competitive games. Um, it doesn't throw anything too far off balance, and it also gives you, to me anyway, a feel of dealing with an opponent because with the limitations of choices in the system, then you know you get that feel of you know if somebody makes a mistake, taking advantage of it, etc., etc. Okay, so let's go ahead and proceed. I'm early on in the game here. I'm only on the second turn, uh, ready to go ahead and start with the first action for the uh, Liberals. I already took the first action for the authoritarian side. I'm playing that side actively, um, you know, partly because I've always been uh, fascinated by German history as well as Russian history, so <laughs> those are both authoritarian powers here at the, at the beginning, clearly. Um, so uh, that's why I'm actively playing that particular side. So the first thing I did was I took this card, uh, this radical party founded and dumped it into the naval race, which I moved the naval race table to the other side. So everybody's on the Nassau class here to start this turn. So let me move you over here and show you Stuka Joe's method. Now, first thing about his method is, and he has videos, by the way, too, if you'd like to see him explaining his method uh, as well. I'm just showing it here how it's actually in a gameplay situation uh, to give you an idea. Um, how it, how it flows and works, but basically there's five spaces here for cards. Some of the cards will be face up, some face down. There's a draw pile. Um, he recommends splitting the deck into two. I have a tendency to leave it as one. That's just again my own personal preference. You can do it. He does have on the instructions. You know, two is recommended. Um, so again, this is kind of one of those your mileage may vary kind of things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So you have five cards here, and then what you do each time for the system as you roll a die. Now the die corresponds to choices here at the bottom of this page. Okay, As you see I rolled a 2, a 2 is an AB slot. 
So if we come back here to the cards, that means that I'm going to be working with cards A and B on this particular choice here. I'm going to be choosing between those two. And there's also an entire sheet that outlines, as you can see there in great detail, I'll zoom in on AB for you, exactly what you're supposed to do with the cards. Even whenever you draw the new cards, do you keep them face up, do you keep them face down, those sorts of things. Okay, So this is really nicely organized and nicely thought out. Um, he even provides a page uh, in the file that he has posted on Board Game Geek. If you click on his uh, avatar and his profile, you'll find the file there. He uh, actually has um, markers that you can glue to dice if you want, or I'm sure there's some place that you could probably get these designed. I just use the little chart, and I just organize it like this so that I have the chart on top, and then I have the cards closest to me because, let's face it, that's where the action is. Okay, So following A, B here for the first action of the Liberals on turn two, I'm going to flip the cards, and then as the instructions say, play card A or B, any allowable purpose. So I could play it for an event, I could play it for ops, however, anything that's legal in the game is basically what he's saying there. Okay, and then at the end, we're going to fill the card, play card space with the topmost card of the draw pile left face down. Okay, and part of the whole thing here with Stuka Joe's method is kind of that fog of war feel, you know, where you don't know where all the cards are. Now, again, you could go ahead and do, like I did on my last video, the two card method, but this one also, as you can see right here, this gives you a little more of a picture of what's going on um, and gives you ideas, too, of what's happening with your opponent uh, um, and um, uh, a little more of a, I don't know, a detailed picture, maybe? I'm not sure exactly how to put it, but it is interesting to do. So we're going to choose one of these, okay? Now, I think what I'm going to do is, since I'm playing one of these two, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play the Russo-Japanese War. So let me take the Russo-Japanese War, and then what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to do this right now rather than at the end of the turn so I can move the camera, um, I fill the space face down. So this card is going to go back into space A face down. And if you notice, I have a different set of dice that I make decisions with, and Stugajo also has counters to keep track of markers, how many times you've played cards, um, so that way you know, like, uh, in some games, you know, like you get to play a card to cancel an opponent's card, then you'll know that. I just use dice and put them across the top here. That's just my own personal preference, okay? So, oh, excuse me, I think I'm getting a cold. Oh, yeesh. All right, so here we go. We got the Russo-Japanese War. Um, I'm trying to decide if I want to play it for the points or play it to influence Russia. Now, early in this game, the Liberals have got a nice foothold in Russia. So let me show you the Russian situation here. In Russia, where the bear lives, um, they've gotten a good foothold here. They've gotten control of the Orthodox Church. They actually got Moscow and the bourgeoisie spaces as well. So they've been very, very busy. Uh, they did a support check in Poland and took out the authoritarian points there. So you know what? I'm going to continue to undermine them okay, with this Russo-Japanese war card. So four authoritarian strength points from Tsarist Army, Nicholas II, or government spaces. All right, so I'll take one from the Tsarist, and then I can only do two per space, but that's okay. That'll drop this down to two, and now the authoritarian player is going to be in deep caca in Russia, which caca actually is quite an appropriate word because it's an Eastern European word. I think it's Slovak, though. Uh, my mother used to use that. My mother was a full-blooded Slovak. Um, so this one has an asterisk, so we're going to remove this from the game. All right, on to the second action phase. Now, again, I'm actively playing the authoritarian one. And again, this is, you know, this is just things I experiment with, different ways I play at times, because, you know, playing solo, um, it is a different animal, it's a different beast. But, um, again, you know, I I'm not, how should I put this? Uh, I'm not a purist in the sense that, you know, everything doesn't have to be simulated you know, correctly, so to speak. You know, people make mistakes all the time. I can't tell you how many times when I played tournament chess, when I was in a time scramble with somebody, that somebody just, you know, left a rook hanging, you know, just sitting there. And it's like you blink for a couple of seconds, you're like, you know, you turn into Scooby-Doo, right? And then it's like, bam, it's off the board, baby. You know, and it's just, you know, and it's a huge blunder, and it happens. People make mistakes, okay? So same kind of thing here. Um, 
like me actively playing because I know I know what I got. Look at that! I've got the scoring card for France, by the way. Another reason I'm doing this video is because I know I have the scoring card. But before I go into France, Viva la France, I'm going to try and get my strength up there. So speaking of which, for my second action, I'm going to play, appropriately enough, Bonapartism and Monarchism. Okay? So here we go. So I'm going to add enough strength points to the French armed forces for control. So that will take me up to four strength points in France. There. The Catholic Church is still in play, by the way, at least for the moment. Although I do know that the Liberals have that card. Okay. Uh, I make a support check in France using this card's ops value. Can't be played after George Clemenceau. Well, Clemenceau hasn't come out yet. So, let's see. Where do I want to do my support check? Um, <laughs> and my problem right now is I don't have a non-battleground space in France. So, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to do it in Picardy so I can knock the Liberal down, so to speak. I did knock down! Sorry. All right, here we go. So, I'm going to roll my die. My support check. Two and three is five. Five. Picardy is four. Minus four is one. So... Unfortunately, wah, wah, I don't get to add anything, but I did knock them down. And now this is a removable event. Okay, So let's head back over here to the solo method. So, And let's see what we're going to get for the second action of the liberal play. So roll a six. Okay, so it looks here, the six here on that space. The six is... The E greater than symbol. Okay. Face-up card for event or lowest fade ops card. Okay. Uh, play any face-up card for the event or play the lowest valued face-up ops card for any allowable purpose. Oh, well, You know what? Um, let's see. If it's spade, draw power, painting, it's facing. Okay. So, you know what? Since I was just talking about France, I'm going to go ahead and play the state secularism in France card to basically knock out that possibility there for the authoritarian player. And then we'll put that there to mark that that's the second card they've played this turn. So, coming back to the map, this is a problem now. Because now what this does is, and let me find the marker, this is going to basically eliminate the Catholic Church space. So remove all strength points from the Catholic Church space. Okay, that space and all connections to it are considered to be absent for the rest of the game. Okay, and we put the marker there to remind us that that's that. And that is a removable event. So it will go into the removable event pile. Ouch. Well, now see, of course, if the die roll had been different, I might have been able to pick something else, and then the liberal player, again, you know, like maybe mental mistake, forgetting, oh, shoot, I had this card. Or, wait a minute, you know what, I, I want to do this more than I want to play this this one here by getting rid of the Catholic Church space. So, you know, it's kind of those kind of things, you know, um, in this. All right, round three. Well, I'm still going to try and get the French scoring card played here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose... Oh, one of my very high-numbered cards here. Mm. Gosh, I'd rather I'd, I'd like to keep this one though. I gotta be honest with you. So I think actually, you know what? I'm gonna play this because this will help me get my job done too. I'm going to play this government-sponsored art. Place one authoritarian SP in each intellectual space except Bosnia and Siberia. Woo! That's brutal. And the reason I chose this is because now I will have a non-battleground and a battleground space controlled in France. Right here. Alright, so I'll place one there. And I will go ahead and place... One here where the French writers are, so that will knock down the liberal control of the French writer space. Let's see, no other spaces there in France. Let me back out here, show you the whole map. OK. 
Okay, so everywhere except, what was it again? Bosnia and Siberia. Okay, so this is actually working out well from an authoritarian perspective because now I will get control here. It does say every space, each intellectual space. So that means Denmark here too, even though it's an independent country. Didn't say not independent countries. Mm. Okay, so I got control there. Uh, in Germany, that's the only intellectual space in Germany. Um, the Venice succession, I already have control and I've already maxed out. That was something about the support checks, but I don't think you can go above the number by placing ops. I'm not 100% sure of that. That's the one thing I'm, I'm a little confused on. I think you can do that and go above it. So I guess I will put one there and that'll just give me more strength, so to speak. Uh, let's see, down here, I can't do Bosnia, and down here in the Balkans, I can't do Siberia, but I can do the one space here in Russia, which will give me control of that, and I think that's all the intellectual spaces. Okay, so that was good, so that'll get me set up for the French scoring to be done now, which I'll do here in a moment, because one of the reasons I wanted to do this video is not only to show you Stuka Joe's method in action, but also to show you a scoring turn. Okay, now, back over here. Doo -doo -doo. Take a little walk. All right, this time the die roll is a two. So, with a two, it's A, B. So, we're gonna flip any face down cards in space A and B. So here we go. Ooh, <laughs> and we can play any for allowable purpose. So actually, the Russia scoring card is here too. Um, now, what I have done before is I've done. Um, whoops, you can't see that. Sorry about that. I have. Um, I've played scoring cards the last time I did this as soon as they showed up. Now that does make things a little unpredictable, but I think that's what I'm going to do here. Okay, so this will be good. This will give us a chance to show two. Scoring rounds in a row to give you two possibilities here, okay? Then we're going to take one from the draw pile and put it face down in that space. All right, let's go score Russia. I know that's the wrong, wrong time period, but that's one of my favorite Russian classical music composer songs. Okay. So, Russia scoring. Now, the first thing we have to do when we get into a scoring situation is we need to do a stability check. Okay? So, stability is done by 10 cards that each side has. Okay? And the side that is not playing the scoring card has to choose first. Okay? So, what I've done is I've taken the 10 cards and made them two different colors. And what I'm going to do is just take two because I'm still sticking with that right now. I'm going to take two off the top and choose one of the two to play. I'll come back out a little bit here. So, let's see what I've got here. Uh, okay. Now, neither one of these really work for them. So, what I did last game was I drew a third card one at a time until basically I came up with a playable card and then I mixed them all back together again. Okay. Let's see. Wow. I'm really going through here. Let's see. Woo! Nope. I'm having trouble here. Hey, something I finally have. Okay, so I will play this one here for this. And again, I keep going after the first two just because, you know, if it was really a person playing, they would keep going. They wouldn't just be like, man, I got these two cards. So, you know, I am flexible when playing solo, and I think you have to be. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right. Now the liberal will choose their cards. Let's see here. Um... So they could play this one, the farming one. 
Uh, let's see. They also could do this. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and play this one for that. And I'll mix these cards all back together on my little mini table. My uh, four and a half, if you will, table that I have here. Okay. So... So the first thing you do here with the stability action is you resolve the cards and you do them in the order of the non-active player, whoever didn't play the scoring card, in other words, first. Okay. So here in Russia, I have played the support of the farmers for the authoritarian. So let's zoom in here a little bit and focus on the Russian area. We'll probably have to come back out a little bit because Russia is huge. Alright, so support of the farmers. So for each farmer space I control in the scoring region. Well, I control one. I have Belarus as the authoritarian player. Okay, I add one authoritarian strength point in church and or government spaces in the scoring region. So, so government or church, which means I could knock down one of the liberals' battleground spaces um, and loosen their control. Uh, let's see. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and knock down the Orthodox Church here. So they'll still have three strength points there, but now I have one in there for that. Now, once you play one of these stability cards, it becomes unavailable until you've played all ten. So you have to bear that in mind as you make your choices here, that once one is done, it's basically gone until you cycle the whole way through again. Okay? Now, ooh, ouch. If you control a church space in the scoring region, well, they don't control the church space anymore. Ouch. Ouch, 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 ouch. I should have thought about that. Whoopsies. Uh-oh, spaghetti -o. See, that's one of those mistake things. So they don't control it, so now they can't put anything. So that's kind of wasted. So now that could happen in a real game, of course. You could go ahead and be like, oh, haha, -ha, I'm going to play testimonials. <laughs> and then, of course, the person plays, bam! And you're like, ah, oh, no. Shoot. All right, let me just make sure I've done this. Um, yep, the non-active player first reveals his stability card and executes its effects. Okay, all right. Ouch, 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 ouch. All right, so now we'll do scoring here, okay? And scoring is going to be seem very familiar to all of you who've played like Twilight Struggle and stuff. So let's total up the spaces here. So the authoritarian player only has control of two spaces. They have Belarus and Symbolism, and that's it. The liberal player also only has control of two spaces. That's the bourgeoisie and the uh, Moscow. Of course, they did have control of the Orthodox Church, but wah, wah, they lost that. So technically, both sides only have a presence. So that's only worth three points. Okay, And they both have a presence because in order to have domination, you have to have more spaces and more battlegrounds. And although the liberals have more battlegrounds here, they only have two spaces, which is the same number of spaces that the authoritarians do. Okay. Now you add one per battleground, so that will make the liberal score four to three, and then plus one per independent space controlled adjacent to the scoring region, um, which nobody has that. So technically, after all this shifting around and stuff, we end up with one point for the liberals. So they go to a positive one, and then we do a crisis check. Now, if you remember from the other video, we're going to go back up here to the crisis track, which there's been a little bit of activity up there. Not a whole lot yet. Um, I was able to play the, the dual, um, dual uh, alliance business already. So, it's a zero, which basically means this is going to fail. So, we roll a six. Woo, good thing it was a zero. So, six plus the tension track, which is zero, is still six minus three. Remember the leftmost box that is uncovered? is only three and you must have seven or better to trigger off the great war so crisis averted no worries there okay so we've scored russia and the liberals managed to eke out a point thanks to their extra battleground space okay now i'll put my yellow die over here to mark that for myself and we're on to the fourth round here now I'm going to go ahead and play France, so again, just to show you a scoring round again. So, we'll play French scoring. It's a very catchy national anthem, you know? <laughs> Alright, I'm shuffling my stability decks here. And another thing you can do, and I do this especially when the decks start to get thinner, 
is I just kind of mix up the cards a little bit and then I roll two dice for the range. Like right now there's nine cards left for each side. Oh, excuse me, that determines which ones that I draw. So like here I rolled a one and an eight. So I'm going to take the first card and the eighth card for the liberals. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I will choose one of the two cards for France. Let's see. Well, blockade. I can't run that one because the British Navy's not ahead. Place enough liberal SP. I'm looking at Workers Unite now. Place enough liberal SP in each non-authoritarian control worker space in the scoring region for control. Ooh, that would definitely help them. So, they will go ahead and play Workers Unite. Now, of course, the other thing you could do if you're actively playing one side like I am is you could go ahead and choose your own card first and then randomly do their card after that. So, that's another wrinkle you can do. I'm just following the rules here to a T because part of this is designed to be instructional. So, I want to keep it that way. Okay, first and seven cards here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So let's see what do I have for authoritarian choices. Da! Got the secret treaty clauses business again. Um, limited franchise. I do control a bourgeoisie space. So you know what? I will play this card. Now again, I mean, maybe I should have thought about that a little bit longer, but for demonstration purposes, I just want to show you. So here we go. Once again, we're going to start with theirs. So they get to place enough liberal SP in each non-authoritarian controlled worker space in the scoring region for control. Okay, so let's go up here to France. Dun, 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 dun. Wish I knew the words. That would be so cool. It's one of my favorite scenes in Casablanca when they do the, the French national anthem, La, La Marseillaise. Is that how you say that? I did not take French in high school, so my apology to any French speakers if I butchered the name of your national anthem. Um, so, space is here. All right. So, Picardy is now going to go up to liberal control. Viva la France! Dijon, love their mustard, is going to go up also there. So, that actually works out very well for them. Okay, so had no authoritarian control in either one of those spaces. Aichiwawa. All right. And again, this card is now no longer available until all the other cards are used. Okay. So now I control a bourgeoisie space in scoring region. I can place two authoritarian SP in government or monarchy spaces in the scoring region. Okay. Well, thing is, there's only one of those in France. And that, of course, is Paris. So I'll put the two there. Bam! Which is going to change the balance of power, knocking down their control of not only a space, but a battleground space, which is important for scoring. Okay, so here we go. So let's start totaling up spaces here. So the authoritarians have one, two, three spaces under their control, including one battleground, like colonials and French army, and one non favism I think is how you pronounce that. Okay, the liberals have control of one, two, they only have two. Ouch. Aichiwawa. So they only have control of two and they don't have a battleground. Okay. So the authoritarians, surprisingly in France, actually have domination. Okay. They control more spaces, three to two, and more battleground spaces. So that gives them six points plus two battlegrounds, seven, eight points altogether. Okay. They don't control any independent spaces, although there are a lot of them, as you can see here, around France, or at least you... There we go. But they don't control any of those, including Belgium. Okay, So that gives the authoritarians a total of eight points. Now, the liberals will get three points for their presence. Okay, And they also will pick up another point because Great Britain is considered liberal, controlled all the time. It is adjacent. That will give them one extra point there because it's adjacent to Brittany and Normandy in the scoring region. So that will take them up to four. So that's going to be eight to four here on the scoring. So we're going to go backwards four spaces. So negative three is where we're going to. And of course, we have to do a crisis roll, which again is kind of perfunctory at this point. So two plus zero is two. Minus three is negative one. Nothing happens. And that's that. Okay. And now we're back over ready to do Stupid Joe's method with the 
next action round, the fourth action round here of this. Now I'll go ahead and finish that and then I'll, I'll go ahead and call it quits with this video here because um, I've accomplished my goal here. So this time it's a one. So a one. I'll go ahead and shift you back over here. There we go. So a one this time, and again, just to highlight the chart here that Stupid Joe spent all this time making these great things. I mean, this really is a wonderful system. Um, I love using it in games where both sides have their own deck. And again, the fact that he's added pages, you should always go back and check the file, because last time I checked his file, he didn't have the 1866 update. The fact that he, you know, adds stuff for active games and stuff is just really cool. Um, he really is a huge asset to the wargaming community. So I tip my hat to Stuka Joe. And if I ever get to Puerto Rico, I will definitely look him up. Just to say hi, if nothing else, and shake his hand for the contributions he's made to our hobby. So, this time, I'm going to choose card C or the lowest faced ops card. Okay? So, so first of all, I gotta go to the draw deck over here, which again, Stuka Joe recommends splitting it into two, the draw deck. I just go ahead and kind of run it as one because that's just my own personal preference. Your mileage may vary, but you can do that. It is um, in his uh, instructions in the file. So, we're going to play either card C, the Culture Conf, or the lowest valued face-up card in spaces A, B, D, and E for any purpose, which would actually be this one, Legacy of Bismarck, Blood and Iron. Um, well, let me zoom back out here so you can see what's going on my choices. Sorry about that. There we go. All right. So now the draw, draw your trigger would be if there's any special cards. Now, by special cards, he would mean things like scoring cards. And again, you know, it's just my personal preference that I just play scoring cards whenever they occur. All right. Let's see. So I could make... Two support checks there. I'm not real keen on playing either one of these because that will unleash um, some serious authoritarian stuff. But I haven't played my naval race, though. Hmm. So I could hold on to Culture Comp if I wanted to. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, no, actually I can't because it has to be the lowest valued one. Well, I could. I could dump Bismarck into there. But, of course, I'm adding it to the die. You know what? I'm just going to play the Culture Conf because that'll be a good event to play. And let's see. So since that was from the deck, I don't have to worry about that. And we'll mark that with that there to show that's the fourth card I have played. So, and again, this will give me a chance to go over support checks again. Because I did make a mistake in last video of how high you can maximize support checks. Okay, so I can do this in intellectual and or church spaces. Okay, uh, cancel the modifier for any adjacent spaces controlled by the authoritarian player. All right, so basically I can go into the belly of the beast and rip his heart out. <laughs> like that. <laughs> All right, however, the bad news is the authoritarians do not control. Um, well, actually, you don't have to control. That's true, you just have to have influence. So I could go back to the Orthodox Church. Hmm. But I could go and try to reclaim some of these intellectual spaces, too, that were lost. You know what, I'm going to go back up here to Germany, because the German scoring card is eventually going to come out. So let me go ahead and do that. So we'll roll the die. It is a 3. Add it to the value of the card. That is 6. There's no adjacent liberal spaces controlled. Actually, Berlin's the only adjacent space. Just notice that. So, 2 times 2 is 4. 6 minus 4 is 2. So that will just remove the two authoritarian pieces and not get anything in there. Now, remember, um, you can't use the same space twice unless it specifically says so as an event. And it does not say uh, that I can do that. So I'm going to assume I have to pick two different spaces. All right, so I'll pick another intellectual space here. Let's see. Let's see. See, now I could choose the one in Russia, but there's a value of only one, so I won't be able to put a whole lot of stuff in there. So really, you want to be looking for spaces that are high-numbered spaces. But of course, then again, that's high-risk reward because you may or may not be able to chisel them down. You know what? I'm going to choose the French writers here and try to kick them out of that space completely because... Just because I want to reclaim France, because it just seems like the liberal thing to do. 
All right, so four and three is seven. Seven. No spaces controlled adjacent for the liberals. So it's seven versus six, which is a difference of one, which will pull this point out and will give them back control of the French rider space for a future turn. All right. And this card goes into the discard pile. And that's that. We're on to round five. Okay. Now, now that I've gone over both kind of methods there, um, you know, obviously, I'm going to move on in terms of videos. I'm going to play this for a little bit yet. I actually having some time today. I am have I have bleh, having. Yeesh. I have some time today. Blitz World and Conflict coming from Compass Games. They had their holiday sale, so it was like 25 bucks off. And I've been thinking about it for a long time. And I thought about it. And I thought about it. And I analyzed it. And I discussed it. And debated it. And I you know looked at videos and looked at feedback on Board Game Geek and finally decided I'm going to pull the trigger on it. Um, because it seems like a, a, an interesting, it seems like an interesting in-between game between, like, say, Axis and Allies, which I loathe, by the way, nowadays, which is funny because when I got that for my 12th birthday, I thought that was the bee's knees. I was just like, oh, you know, um, so, um, it's kind of like an interesting, it seems like an interesting space step in between game between that and like say unconditional surrender in Europe. Of course the bonus about Blitz is it is a global aspect of it. Um, and it seems to me, and I could be wrong about this, so in the comments you can let me know, but it seems to me it's kind of um, in the same category as Cataclysm in terms of like playability and stuff, but of course it's make it's strictly speaking st strictly speaking sticking with a more World War II based um, premise. Whereas Cataclysm could go completely off the rails and you could have all kinds of funky stuff happen, which is why I love Cataclysm. So, that'll be coming. Uh, I might mess around with that next. Uh, or I will mess around with that next. As far as shooting videos go, we'll see. Uh, once I get a chance to get my feet wet with it, so to speak. So, since this is the last video somebody asked before, my final thoughts on this. So, let me give you my final thoughts on um, this game right now, anyway, into my second play. I really like it. Um, it's a lot of fun. I love the flavor. I love this time period even more than I like the Cold War, um, which I very much like the Cold War because, you know, I was a child of the latter half of the Cold War. And um, I really, really like the feel of it. I like the maneuvering. I like uh, the events. I like the tension track. I think that's totally cool, uh, the way that, you know, you can unleash the Great War. I also like the fact that you have two ways to resolve the Great War. You can either do it with the rules, or you can do it with the mobilization cards, which I did last time because I just liked the idea of the mobilization cards. I thought that was totally cool. All I did for that was the two um, card solo method, and then that way if there was a card that, you know, like Russia can only use if they're a member of the Central Powers, um, then I, you know, had a chance to choose a different one. So I wasn't stuck. I don't, I don't allow myself to get stuck with something that's completely unrealistic because... You know, that's just dumb. Nobody's going to play a mobilization card if they're not part of the central powers. It's just, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so I like, I like that. And it's just, this game's just a lot of fun. It's quick to move through. Um, it has its own little feel um, to it. So I would recommend it. I would say if you like Twilight Struggle and you like this time period in particular, this is, this is something to, to consider picking up. I would pick it up now rather than later because right now it's just released and one of the things I like the Compass Games seems to do, uh, at least they did it with um, uh, Russian Besieged Deluxe Edition, is uh, they actually had the pre-order price available for a while after they released it. And they just released this game last Friday, Europe and Turmoil. So if you're thinking about it, it's like it's a twenty-some dollar difference. It's normally going to be seventy-nine bucks. It's fifty-five right now. Um, I would do it partly, and I'm just going to be bluntly honest here about it, partly because with the components that are involved here, I think 55 is actually a better price than 79 um, For 79 bucks, I would expect a mounted mat board for one thing. That's just my own personal preference, but, um, you know, especially when the counters are just, you know, they're just mostly numbers. Yeah. You know, again, my personal preference, but... Uh, I'm just telling you that if you if you're you know you're thinking about it, you're sitting on the fence about this one, I would do it sooner rather than later before that price change occurs. Uh, but again, if you like pre World War One stuff, 
or even World War One stuff, you like Twilight Struggle type of structure, this game is a lot of fun. I'm having a blast playing this by myself. Um, and I, I can see myself playing this from time to time. And the best part is, I can see myself playing this with my wife because she loves Twilight Struggle. And I think she's really going to enjoy this game too when we get around to it. So, those are my final thoughts on the game. I give it a thumbs up. Another way of putting it. So, this is Tim Korchnoy from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching. And next time I chat with y'all, y'all, as we would say here in the South, um, it's probably more than likely going to be from Blitz, a world in conflict. Because uh, I am very intrigued right now by that. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, you know, I I'm more willing to take a chance on games that have like some kind of sale thing like that. Um, because, you know, it's to me it's less of a gamble. You know, because it's like, well, okay, you know, I didn't pay full price for it, you know, that kind of thing. So, but again, just my personal preference. So, I'll see you next time from there. As always, thanks for watching.